welcome to all of you that are that are here today. Thank you, and we we apologize for the short notice. Um, this is our second um, webinar Zoom meeting that we are doing regarding Medicaid transformation and tailored plans. We actually um, decided to convert this into a meeting so that those of you that wanted to ask your questions live or or be on camera or make this just a little bit more personal could do so. But I'm going to ask for everyone to please keep their um, keep their microphones on mute. Go ahead and do that right now um, so that I don't have to do that for you. Um, and then when it's time to ask live questions, certainly you can un unmute yourself. So my name is Melinda Plew. I'm Director of Advocacy and Chapter Development here at the Arc of North Carolina. I want to just um, quickly, uh, uh, before I introduce John and, and Lisa and two that you already know, just, just read you something so that you can understand kind of why we're doing this. So um, a little bit of history. In 2015, the North Carolina General Assembly established Medicaid transformation for the following reasons. Um, improved population health, improved coordination of care, improved access to resources that affect health, and cost reduction. Uh, the North Carolina General Assembly established two types of health plans for Medicaid recipients. Those were the standard plans um, for the largest portion of Medicaid recipients and tailored plans for people with IDD or have a traumatic brain injury, severe and persistent mental illness, or substance use disorder who have the need for more intense or tailored services and supports. Um, and then back in July of 2021, the standard plans launched, which hopefully all of you know, and tailored plans are set to launch in December of 2022, which is just a few months from now. Um, hence the reason that we are trying to gather as much information as possible, share it with you, and make sure that we um, answer your questions um, as, as um, thoroughly as we possibly can. So I hope that is helpful. Um, we did one webinar uh, several weeks ago, right around Memorial Day, and there were still 38 questions in the queue after the end of the Q&A session. We gathered those questions together. I have I have those. And, and so today's format will be such that I will go through some of those questions and have them answered um, for you live. I would encourage you to use the chat only to put questions, um, questions in there. Um, we may not be able to get to it on today's webinar, of course, if we're going through these, these questions um, consecutively, but we are gathering those and we are going to have our next um, meeting or Zoom webinar for you on August the 4th at 4.30. So as soon as this one is complete, we'll go ahead and get that information out to you. As always, this is being recorded. Um, it will go up on our YouTube channel. So make sure that you're following the Arc of North Carolina's YouTube channel and we'll have it there for you. Um, and you can um, refer to it, or if you're working with a family, you can also refer to it. Um, and we will have it translated today's session into Spanish as well. So with that, I'm gonna go off camera and I'm going to introduce John and Lisa to you. Um, and I will, um, I will help facilitate the Q&A part. Thanks. All right, well, good afternoon. I'm John Nash, Executive Director of the ARC of North Carolina. And as we, be, as we get started, the hope is that we can answer a lot of questions. The expectation that I have is that there are questions that are out there that we don't have answers to yet. Um, and we, we ask patients mostly because if we don't have them, probably nobody else does either. We are working closely with the department to get those answers, but these sessions and these conversations that we're having are extremely helpful because we're turning around and feeding your questions and, and the issues that we don't already know the answers to back to them. And it's helping us fill in the blanks well, on a lot of things. We're answering questions those there. questions for you. And at the end, I will be going through all of the questions that you drop in the Q&A during our time together today. So with that- everybody. Everybody, please mute. Please mute everyone. There we go. Anyway, right. I can do that. Welcome. We're glad you're here, and I'll let Lisa introduce herself. Hello, everybody. I'm Lisa Petit. I'm the Deputy Director for the ARC of North Carolina and have um, been engaged for some time in the development of um, care management for the ARC of North Carolina and have learned an awful lot about managed care and uh, the state's transformation plan. So 
we hope we can help you develop some understanding today as well. Awesome, thank you. I've got the questions pulled up, so I'm just going to start rolling through them. And either John or Lisa, um, you guys feel free to 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 weigh in. So, first question right off off the bat: What's the difference between a tailored plan and managed care? Managed care is when they take all the people that are in a large pool. In this case, a whole lot of people, maybe thousands. Average the cost, the high cost, the low cost, the medium cost into one bundle. And that's the per member per month. So each person would, would receive a certain amount of money that would come through to the provider. So we need to be, we have to be able to provide the services for that dollars per month. And it's it's a average rate. So some of the high people that need a lot more care and support, it's going to be the exact same rate as the low people for our end. Your end, it'll be a little bit different. The tailor plan is the mechanism to provide that service. And so that is the that's the mechanism that the state of North Carolina has come up with to provide the managed care. And so again, it's it's an average cost of per members per month that we get a bundle, a lump sum to provide the services for everyone. And then it's our job to make sure that everybody gets what they need. Okay. Um, can can one of you address what is going to change for those folks who have B3 services? Yeah, I'll take that. Uh, these free services will go away on November 30th. Um, that is because the state's B waiver will go away on November 30th. However, those services are being mapped over to a different waiver, which is a different way of funding those services. It's called the I waiver, or you may have it here it referred to as the I option. I with a small I, um, if you see that in writing. And the state is currently mapping uh, some of the B3 services over to the I waiver so that people can get similar supports in the community with that new funding source, the I waiver. So yes, B3 services are going away, but there's something that's gonna replace it, which we're learning more and more uh, details about. Um, the state is, is getting ready to send their plan for the I waiver services to CMS for approval. Before that, there will be a public comment period um, that's required. I believe the public comment period has to last for 30 days. So watch for that because you're going to want to read that plan and make public comment if, if that affects you. Excellent. Thank you. Um, can one of you address what the role of, North, of the ARC of North Carolina is going to be moving forward? I think either of us could do that. I'm going to let Lisa do it because she is hip and shoulder in the middle of it um, and helping us put that program and that plan together. Yeah, so um, first off, I would say the ARC of North Carolina is still going to be the extremely strong advocacy organization that you see today. That's never going away. We're gonna to continue to provide the choice of services that we provide in self-directed fashion. We're gonna to continue to support employment in a few places, continue to do guardianship services for a bunch of people, continue to do housing for a bunch of people, um, we will no longer do resource advocacy or, or provide the community navigation service because that is one of the services going away. Um, however, we have been certified to be a, become a care management agency and we'll be building out those services, probably starting a little bit small and building that over, over the next three, four, five years. Care management is one of the linchpins of this managed care system will be working with all six LMEs, which are now be becoming tailored plans. I think it's okay to go ahead and call them tailored plans at this point. Um, and we'll be contracting with them to provide care management in the community for folks with IDD all over the state. Um, the care management is the piece that pulls it all together. So that's where you get the crux of whole person, person-centered care. If you think of how long our community support system has kind of been isolated from our medical system of services, this is an opportunity for us to pull those two together. Care managers being that kind of quarterback or coordinator that brings it all together in a person's life around a person-centered plan hopefully for the benefit of those folks receiving care management 
to improve the quality of life, to, to improve health overall. Um, it's going to be a um, it's going to be a new a new function in the service system um, that will be available to everyone in the Taylor Plan on December first. So the ARC will uh, engage in care management at first small numbers, and then over time we expect it to grow pretty large. Um, the ARC will continue doing the services that we're already doing, as I said before. And as the eye waiver services start, we'll begin adding on some of those eye waiver services for folks we support who need those services. Are you hearing me? Yep. Now we're yeah. Okay, sorry. What's going to happen if a person's health needs change uh, and they need more services or health care? How complicated is it going to be to get those services added? Theoretically, it's supposed to be easy um, because where we are as the care manager, we will be involved directly with the individual. And if the needs change, we're able to ask for and do new assessments and make adjustments and, and, and work in that environment. I say theoretically because we haven't done it yet. And, and while on our end, I don't think it's complicated at all. We're still dealing with mechanisms from the state and from the LMEMCO slash Taylor plans that have never been tested or tried. And so that might be a little bit more complicated. We won't know until we get in the middle of this. What I can say is that what Lisa said about us remaining as an advocate is, is exactly why we, we fought to have something like this put back in place so that when somebody does have a greater need, we will be there working and advocating to get what that individual needs to be able to take care of them and to help meet their needs. So somebody asked the question, my daughter's on SSDI. She's on the wait list uh, for innovations. She's working with um, some, some services under CAPD. How is this going to affect her? Are receiving cap d services will not be affected by this yet they're being held out or excluded from medicaid transformation and managed care for the time being we think that ultimately the state will bring those folks into the managed care system but for now that group is excluded so you likely won't see if you're getting cap d services you likely won't see any differences immediately yours might be to three years down the road. Will the same provider agencies for the innovations waiver now still be the providers of services? For the most part, yes. I mean, the, the services that have to occur will still be occurring. What will happen is there will be an independent care management agency. The problem comes is if your care, if your provider service provider is also a care manager, they cannot do both. So that becomes a conflict of interest. And so if there is an, an agency that you've, for instance, gotten community navigator and community guide uh, services and supports from, and they choose to be a care management agency, you could ask for them to be your care manager. Um, on the other side of that, if they are doing services, um, you can't do services in care management. But again, choices choice at the core of this, an individual choice. And that's part of what the care manager's role will be is to help facilitate the individual being able to make that choice. So can you guys talk a little bit about community navigation a, a little bit more? Um, is it going away for people who have B3 or just the innovations folks? Um, and then uh, somebody also asked, will the change for community navigator be reflected in the new clinical coverage 8P that was shared? I'll take that. I'm not sure about clinical clinical coverage 8P policy. I'm not sure if it's covered in there, but basically here, here's what's happening. Community navigation is a service that is uh, funded by either the innovations waiver or B3 dollars. And it's authorized for folks with IDD through the LMEMCO system. You all probably know that. It has a lot to do with coordinating things for folks, connecting them to resources um, and the types of uh, supports and services that the state deems are now becoming a portion of care management 
and they will see it as a duplication if they if they run the typical community navigation service and the care management service, they won't do both. And so they're terminating the community navigation service as they start up care management. Now there is one group that they will keep community navigation for, and that is the agency with choice and employer of record families who require a person to train them to, to uh, implement those models of service provision. And, and there is some ongoing mentoring um, to help people manage those models. They're very self-directed models of service. They require a lot of um, family um, or, or personal representative involvement. Um, it, it's a job. It, it's like running, uh, for those families, it's like running your own provider organization for your family member. Um, so community navigation will stay in the waiver only for that purpose to train and mentor agency with choice and employer of record um, services. Otherwise, no one else will get community navigation. They'll essentially change the service definition and reduce it down to only that function. Okay, and I, this is somewhat of a follow-up question, but somebody asked, um, my adult son is new to the system. Um, he is on the innovations wait list, but has not accessed community navigator yet. What is, what is he supposed to do if he's not eligible for managed care because he's a dual dually eligible individual? There are lots of unmet needs we hope would be addressed through Community Navigator. So dual eligibility gets complicated, but here's what we know. Even if he has dual eligibility for Medicaid and Medicare, if he falls under the tailored plan or the current LME MCO, he will be eligible for care management. He could go ahead and request community navigation, even though it's going away. It's fine to go ahead and request it. They're still authorizing that service. Any people on the wait list for the innovations waiver do request and receive that service. It's a good idea to do that because it, you, you get at least some coordination of services in your life when that happens. Sorry for that phone ringing. And then when that goes away, he could transfer over to the, hopefully the I waiver service. So in addition to that, something to be aware of, when care management initiates, whether you have a waiver slot or you are on the wait list, you are eligible for a care manager. Now, that doesn't mean that you have the services that go, I mean, a waiver services or waiver services, you have to have a waiver slot, but you do have access to a care manager because care managers will be working not just with behavioral and habilitative supports, they will also be working with physical and and physical health. So it, it, it's a treating the whole person really. So if you're on a, on the wait list waiting, you will have a care manager and, and there may be some options, including with the, the 1915 I option that may be available to you, depending upon your circumstance. You're muted, Melinda. While we wait for Melinda, I'll, I'll take this last question that dropped into the chat. Can we do a quick recap of the LME MCO and Taylor plan? Yes, the LME MCOs are becoming tailored plans. A tailored plan is a federally defined health plan that coordinates and manages whole person care integrated in integrated fashion. The, the tailored plans will begin managing or helping to manage all care for a person, not just the community supports that they've been receiving, but also coordinating the medical care to go along with that. So LME will become tailored plan and provide those functions. The Sorry about that. That's okay. The likelihood is if you say I'm with partners, partners will be your LME MCO or it'll be your tailored plan. You'll still be dealing with basically the same group of people. Or if you're with VIA or if you're with Sand Hills, wherever, whatever the, the entity agency you're with now, they will be the same entity on December 1st. They'll just be called Taylor Plans instead of LME MCO. Right. 
Um, sorry about that. Thanks for covering for me. Um, so this this um, mom or dad had a question about their child with autism um, in the last webinar. Um, will this program allow a self-advocate with autism who isn't employed and has no insurance to get some, some help or some services? If your son has received services through an LMEMCO, is eligible to receive services through an LMEMCO, then he would be eligible for care management and care management could help coordinate the services he needs. I think, I think that answers your question. Okay. How will state funded services for those who are on the waiting list work with this change? State funded services will also be managed by the tailored plans. I don't think much will change there, except that those folks will also become eligible for care management if they want or need it. Okay. Um, rolling through these quickly so we can get to everyone's questions. The LMEMCO does not typically permit waiver recipients to change their care coordinator, their care manager, will there be more flexibility for case managers? There is supposed to be. The, at the outset, you have the ability and you should be getting communication correspondence from probably from the LMEMCOs letting you know that the open enrollment period is, will begin and that's in August, isn't it, Lisa, when that those letters are supposed to go out? On August 15th, the choice period begins, yeah. So you get to choose the the care manager that you work with. You will you'll still be in the same LMEM MCO catchment area, the same tailor plan catchment area. But you'll be able to choose the care manager that you work with. If you cho don't choose or you miss the deadline, there is an algorithm that the state has put together that will help will choose for you, and you'll be assigned a care manager. At some point. Uh, once that's done, if you choose, you say, you know what, that's not the one I wanted, or I made the wrong choice, I clicked the wrong box, you have two free shifts during the course of this first year to be able to make changes. And after that, I believe there's an annual, it's kind of like an open enrollment period where you can make adjustments. But you do get to choose and you can make changes. Uh, again, the idea is that this is all about individual choice um, and giving people that choice is, is a key element of the whole framework of this. Let me so, just, one, yeah. Can I add one thing there? Because I'm, I'm detecting we might be talking about two different levels of choice. John's describing for you the choice of care management organization. Your question might have been about some some LMEs won't let you choose within their set of care coordinators. They won't let you choose which one you want to work with. Um, you get who you get, right? It's it's for a care coordinator in an LME. Um, that level of choice, which person you will work with, not which agency you will work with, will be dependent on how the organization works. So for instance, if you choose the ARC, we'd do our best to make sure you have a care manager that works well with you. <clears throat> and if you called us and said, I don't like my care manager, we'd probably first ask you to please try to work it out. Um, but if you couldn't, if we couldn't work it out together, then we would look at having you assigned to a different care manager within the ARC. Um, and what John's talking about is that organization level choice that's a, a different level and you will have a choice period where you'll be able to choose either a care management organization in the ARC or another provider who's doing what we're doing or the tailored plan itself could provide your care management or an advanced medical home, which if you have a lot of medical issues, you might wanna choose an advanced medical home to provide your care management. Those are typically the larger physician's offices with someone on staff. Maybe they already have a care manager or a social worker who's working with people with complicated situations and they're gonna be providing care management as well. So when you're making that choice in August, the choice period starts August 15th, runs to October 14th. So it's about two months long. You'll choose the agency, but not the actual person that's gonna be your care manager. 
can one of you speak again about folks who are dually eligible um, with Medicare and Medicaid? Um, individuals who get Medicare are going to want to keep their PCP, but they will still need community services through Medicaid. And what about folks on the innovations waiver? Um, uh, you said they were excluded from tailored plans, but innovations waiver individuals are required to have it. Okay, we didn't, let's let's back up to that one. We didn't say they were excluded from tailored plans. Innovations waiver will be run by the tailored plans and everyone in who, who has a waiver, innovations waiver or TBI waiver will be eligible for care management. If you choose not to receive care management, hmm. you keep your care coordination within the tailored plan. But if you go to the care management level, then you go to the choice level where you choose tailored plan, care management agency, or advanced medical home to do your care management itself. Queen and good queen. So that was a little correction on the end there, but Melinda, take me back to the beginning of that question. The dual eligibility, right? Um, sorry, hold up one second. Um, Individuals who get Medicare will want to keep their PCP, but will still need to get community services through Medicaid. So again, if, if that person is currently being served under an LME MCO, they will be in a tailored plan and they will be eligible for care management, even though they have dual eligibility and receive both Medicaid and Medicare. There's a lot of information out about people who have dual eligibility being excluded from the Taylor plan launch. In some instances, that is true for people who aren't already getting services under an LME MCO. If you have IDD and you have significant needs, you will be in the Taylor plan. You will be eligible for care management, even if you have dual eligibility. Okay. Um, can we talk about employer of record. How will EORs be affected, um, especially with Community Nav Navigator going away? Uh, will an EOR family be required to have an extender or navigator? Um, will they be required to have an extender or navigator? Typically, EOR, which is employer of record, happens under the innovations waiver. The only requirement is that you have care coordination. Now, most of care coordination is rolling up under care management. If you think of care coordination at this level, care management's at this level. You could refuse care management and just get care coordination from your tailored plan care coordinator as you are today. Or you could bump up to care management, have kind of a more holistic approach, someone to help you with more things, perhaps an extender in the mix, which is like a care management helper. Um, and, and the hope would be you'd have better, um, more coordinated, holistic services. And did I miss a piece of that question? Oh, how, the, how will this affect EOR? We'll have to deal with the community navigation issue um, because there are several agencies doing employer of record services now. Um, and I'm not sure how they will maintain those community navigators to provide that support for employer of record. That is really up to each provider and they're, and everyone's trying to figure, figure out how to do that right now. They will not be able to provide you employer of record support and care management at the same time. Um, so let's say you're getting employer of record support from, from us, from the ARC of North Carolina then we cannot do your care management. And you would not have an extender in that mix because the extender is connected to the care management piece. I hope that makes sense. It does get a little confusing with EOR. We actually talked about doing a separate session just for EOR families on these confusing issues. Um, so we're, we're looking at that possibility. So the, the next set of questions is all um, related to medical providers. So. If a doctor isn't signed up with the new, what's going to happen if the doctor doesn't sign up with the new system? 
like any insurance company, if you're not in the network, you can still use your doctor, but there will be out of network costs. And we were coming across some questions today. We're not sure exactly what that looks like, whether Medicaid picks it up or whether Medicaid just covers the base cost and you have to pick up the difference. But it, in effect, it's like any other insurance plan. If you use a doctor that's outside your network, then you can you incur out of network costs. That said, what we're understanding is that pediatricians that are serving the IDD community will likely all be signed up because they're already there. If you have a doctor that's currently receiving Medicaid uh, and taking Medicaid uh, patients, and he hasn't he or she hasn't signed up, then you need to talk to them about getting signed up. And really, this is this is the mechanism to do what they've been doing. If they're accepting Medicaid today, then we need to talk to them about getting them signed up with the right networks. And there's several that are out there. Um, and Lisa, you can probably tell us it used to be CCNC. Now it's what is it? Now it's uh, CCPN. Um, CCPN. Yeah. But there are there are other networks out there that you can connect your doctor to and get them signed up before December so that it's all clean and clear and ready to go. CCPN is Community Care Physicians Network. I believe I have that right. Um, and they're a statewide organization that really has, for a long time, they've worked with doctors um, and helped them support their patients who have Medicaid funding to have the best possible health, really. They run a lot of um, data analysis for doctors like I'll give you an example. Um, CCPN might give a report to a physician that says you have 150 people in your uh, practice with diabetes and high blood pressure. And uh, we can help you with 75 of these by calling them and reminding them to take their medication, checking them on, on, on occasionally to see if they've had their blood pressure taken. We can do this set of services for you to help you promote their best health. That's kind of how CCPN works in the background. Um, and they, they help doctors, practices, or physicians, groups manage uh, large scale issues in the, the folks that they, that they see. Um, so, and most doctors who serve people who receive Medicaid funds are already signed up with CCPN um, and all the tailored plans have contracted with CCPN as well. So there's already a connection there between most of our doctors and the tailored plans, which is, which is good. I think from what we've heard, the, the group we have to worry about are the specialists. And in IDD world, we have lots of need for specialists. Um, and make sure that your specialist is contracted with your tailored plan. There will be, and we're gonna try to find these links and publicize them for everybody. There will be uh, um, provider list at the state level and at the tailored plan level where you could go check to see if your doctor is in the network. So also, we'll be looking for those to get them out. If I remember correctly, at the end of the last legislative session, they passed a law that requires that if you are about to get services or treatment from a hospital, an emergency room, somebody that's outside your network, they're supposed to inform you of that. And I, I would have to go back and look at the specifics of that legislation. But the question of what if I go to a doctor and they're not in my network, what happens can possibly be avoided in advance if they notify you like the way they're supposed to, according to the law. Um, but we'd have to dig a little deeper and find out how that actually applies under these circumstances because it's brand new legislation that just passed. Okay, um, so there are some kind of specific questions. Um, in Charlotte, Atrium and Novant are the two major players. Do we know if they're part of the new system or not? It will be all hospitals will be contracting with Taylor plans. Some doctors will now have to credential um, for standard plans and now multiple tailored plans, especially specialists. Why would they bother for the low Medicaid rates? Well, and to make that easier, the tailored plans are also contracting with the standard, standard plans in order to leverage the doctors already in their system. And 
and try to make this more efficient so those doctors don't have to do both, but it can flow through the tape, the standard plan contract. Um, the last part of the question, why would they make it more? Why would they bother when Medicaid rates are so low? Well, the bother is population health. That really is the root of all of this. How can we help our entire population in the state of North Carolina become healthier? Because if we can become healthier, theory goes and proof shows you won't need as many doctors. You won't need as much medical treatment um, overall. And this is about large numbers, averages at, at the population health level. So that, that's why they're doing it. Even though the Medicaid rates may be lower, we can help those people become healthier and perhaps hold down some of those costs as well. If our son's doctor currently is billing through Medicaid, are they still going to bill the same way? And same goes for prescriptions. Uh, will Medicaid still pay for the medication at our pharmacy? Yes. Those entities will still get paid. Yeah. Well, keep, keep in mind that Medicaid is still Medicaid. The only change here is how Medicaid is being managed at the state level. So there are waivers to change to allow the states to create their own plan. We've had the innovations waiver running by itself. We're about to go into care management and tailor plans that will absorb some of those things, but Medicaid still pays for the same things. That's, that's a federal element and the mechanism to deliver it is all that's changing. Could I still make a doctor's appointment without calling my care manager? Sure. Yeah, absolutely. I hope so. Our care managers should encourage personal empowerment. You know, we don't want to make people dependent on us. Um, we would we would like to coordinate the things people need help with, um, but people are people are going to need to do some things for themselves as well. And to add to that, though, I mean. The way I understand the plan is put together, individual choices is, is paramount. That said, I can't vouch for anybody else, I would assume, and would hope that they would do the same thing. I know how the ARC will be approaching it, which is exactly the way I think we're supposed to, which is to, to allow you to, to have this much flexibility and freedom to make those kinds of calls. And you need to go to the, see the doctor, go see the doctor. You know, and, and we'll be working with families and individuals in that, in that fashion. The only thing we can't do is guarantee that somebody else in another organization will do it exactly the same way. Again, I would assume they would, but we have no control over what they do or how they do it, right or wrong. We only can control how we approach it. How will a dentist play into the role of tailored plans? Right now, dentists with Medicaid are hard to come by. Um, does anybody <laughs> want to speak to dental care? We absolutely want to speak to dental care and advocate strongly for it. The dental care has been carved out of managed care, which means the dentists are excluded. They get to keep doing their thing the way they still do it. I mean, the way they've been doing it. Now, many people believe that dental care is vital to whole person health. I, I would agree with that. Um, we need more Medicaid dentists or dentists who will accept Medicaid. And there is an effort underfoot. In fact, we had a staff member in a meeting today um, with the Oral Health Collaborative of North Carolina trying to build uh, grassroots advocacy around putting dental in to managed care so that dentists, more dentists would accept Medicaid more Medicaid patients would get dental treatment that they need, um, and they would be a part of the entire system and that whole person care and complete health. Uh, so there, there is effort underway to make that happen. It's probably two or three years down the road, and it probably will be dependent on the legislature. What I've experienced working with in this, this arena in the, in the policy side, the dental lobby is a very strong lobby. It is strong in North Carolina. It is strong nationwide. And for their reasons, they've argued to, to carve themselves out. I can't fault them. I can't, I, I don't know all the thinking behind it. I just know that that's what they've done. 
and there are efforts to carve them back in, but it may, it's certainly not going to happen immediately. It'll be something down the road if it happens at all. My child, in addition to IDD, is medically complex. When will we know more about the AMH that was mentioned in our first webinar? Um, that's a great question. In early August, we will start seeing each tailored, tailored plan publish their providers in their network um, on their website. So you probably know who your tailored plan is. You might want to start watching now their website, um, but eventually uh, those AMHs should be listed on that website as a provider in their network. In addition, I believe their websites will also tell you which AMHs have been certified to do care management. If, if you're wanting to go that route and have your care management done by an AMH, keep in mind the choice period gives you the ability to choose that AMH to do your care management if they're certified and if that's the direction you wanna go. Now I will say there are going to be few and far be between those AMHs. There will be um, more in the triangle than anywhere else in the state because of Duke and UNC. Both hospitals are starting up um, several teams of AMH providers uh, to do care management. They're starting up the care management portion of those AMHs. Um, in the East, I think we may have one in Wilmington and maybe one in Greenville. I'm not even sure if the West is gonna have one in their region, in, in the VIA region. So it's gonna be sporadic throughout the state, except where you have major university hospitals, teaching hospitals, and there you'll likely see more. Of course, that's where most of our specialists are too. You know, Many families have to drive to those specialists on a regular basis. So um, you'll need to watch that um, and, and see which AMH becomes certified as a CM, as, as a care management entity. So the last two questions um, from the previous webinar are with regard to care management in general. Um, are care managers essentially the same thing as a care coordinator? I don't understand the difference or why a care manager is going to be better than my care coordinator. You know, that is a great question. And it's, I've had the thought myself, it is confusing, isn't it? So long ago we had case management, then we had care coordination. Now we're talking about care management. How do you define all these things? There are some intricate differences defined at the federal level between these things. Think of care coordination as coordinating your innovations waiver services. That's probably about all you get. They're gonna check in with you every once in a while as they're required to. They're gonna write a plan. They're gonna share that plan with your direct support provider long range goals, and then your support, direct support provider is gonna develop short range goals. You probably know that routine if you have the innovations waiver. If care manager comes in on top of that system, they're able to do all of that. Plus, what else do you need? Are you in school? Do you need help with your IEP? What about transportation? What about your doctors? What kind of health issues do you have? Let's get you seen by a dentist. <laughs> Let's get you seen by specialist. Maybe you need some physical therapy. Maybe you need some OT. What about speech? Do you need assistive technology? It's more the, whoa, whole person. Housing. Do you have enough food? Are you safe in your home? It's going to be the whole ball of wax. It's going to be whole life perspective that a care manager brings in, as opposed to care coordination is just kind of coordinating your waiver services, and that's it. That's my best explanation today. <laughs> and we'll continue to evolve and learn more as we get into the middle of it. Well, the, the, the other element of that, though, that, that's critical under case management originally back you know, 12, 13, 14 years ago, case management was independent, which meant that the people controlling the money were not the ones making the decisions about services and where things went. Care coordination pulled all of that in under the umbrella of the LMEMCO. So they're making the decisions about not only the money, but what services they're going to contract with. Care management, where we're headed, starts out 
it's kind of a hybrid. It starts out 80% of the care management will occur by care managers employed by the, the Taylor plans, ALME MCOs, but 20% will be independent care managers, organizations like the ARC and others. Over the next five years, there is a glide path that will go from what is currently 20% independent care managers to eventually it'll be 80% care independent care managers and 20% done by the, the Taylor plans. And so the intent is, you know, a care manager could be the LMEMCO as it is today. It could be an agency like the ARC, a, care man, a CMA, care management agency, or it could be the Advanced Medical Health Home, AMH+. So it could be any one of those, but again, the independent portion of that, that's what's what has been brought back into the whole process that has been missing for the last 12, 13 years. So actually that that question about glad path and was was the last question. So I am going to um, go down through the chat now and let's answer those questions. Um, I have high functioning ASD and I receive CLS and community networking. How will the new plans affect these services? Did we did we answer that question? And and if you are wanting to come on camera and um, either explain or uh, let us see you, you're welcome to do that. No no pressure there, but um, you're you're welcome to do that. Oh hi, <laughs> that's your question, Joshua. So how are you? Hi, how are you? I do well. How are you? My mom's with me. Hi, mom. <laughs> Hello, Allie. So I, we saw your question, Joshua, and you also said, why is community community navigator going away forever? Did, did we answer your question or do you still have that same question? Um, well, I was wondering, um, I have high functioning ASD, okay. but, and I, I receive CLS and community networking. How will the new plans affect my services? I'm assuming if you're receiving CLS and community networking, you have the innovations waiver, right? That's correct. Okay. So you will continue to receive those services through the waiver. Okay. And you will have an opportunity to either continue working with your current care coordinator or choose care management. And if you choose care management, then you will have an opportunity to choose what agency does your care management. Okay. So you could you could get that from the tailored plan and it could be the same person who's your care coordinator because okay. they're all training to become care managers. Right. Or you could go to someplace like the ARC or other organizations that are doing care management or as we talked about, one of these doctor's offices that are going to be doing some care management. I see. Um, and I know about care management is care management is basically a higher up from the care coordinator. Exactly. And yeah. Why is community, and I know that why the community navigator is living for, for our lives is because someone is called an extender who is leading the management agency will oversee, will fill the role. Exactly. They, the, the state believes and, and, and probably CMS at the federal level contends that everything we're doing with community navigation will be done within care management. So okay. there's no sense in having two, they think. There's no sense in running both at the same time. So um, it's about merging everything. Exactly. That's a great yeah. word. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to quote you on that if, you, uh -huh. if it's okay with you. I like that. I like that, what, the way of thinking about that. All right. Thank you very much. I'm going to go on and get off camera. Thank you, Joshua. Joshua. Um, so... Uh, for a family that is self-directing services, agency with choice or EOR, are they still going to have a community navigator? Um, that was your question, Sheila. Um, did, has, I think that has been answered. Okay. All right. I think, I think we're going to keep rolling. Uh, can you please do a recap of LME, MCO, and Taylor plan. I came in late. Thank you. I think that we um, will probably skip over that one because we're recording and we're going to be able to, to, to share that with you. And we, in the interest of time, we're going to keep rolling if that's okay. Um, 
Patricia asks, when will new slots open? I've heard that the wait is still many years. Oh, and I see you on camera, Patricia, if you'd like to clarify. You're muted. You're muted, Patricia. I'm sorry, Patricia, we're not able to hear you. If you hold your space bar down and speak, I think it will work. Just hold it. Uh, we're, in. we're still not able to hear you. Um, just either one, either one, if you want to take the question, when will new slots open so because yeah, of the waiting list? I can, I can jump in. Can you hear me now? There you go. Yeah, there you go. Okay. I just want to know, I know that I've been on innovations for many, many years. I just want to know how long the wait list is now. I, I talk to friends. I try to help people. I'm very involved. Um, and I just want to get an idea. Is this going to improve the wait list? I've heard it can be as much as nine years. Actually, it could be a lot more than that. Yeah. Uh, and, and let me, I'll, I'll answer that because it becomes, a, it's, a, it's a different policy question. And that's one of the one of the misnomers, I think, of, of what the state's doing, this isn't going to create any new waiver slots, at least ways not through this mechanism. And so when we talk about a wait list, there is only, I mean, there's not a single wait list. There is each LMEMCO currently has its own wait list and each LMEMCO within that LMEMCO has multiple different criteria for different wait lists. So it's it is literally when they talk about the registry of unmet needs, it is registries, multiple of unmet needs. The department's currently working, the Department of Health and Human Services is working on a plan to not manage those multiple registries, but to consolidate the information so you get a clear answer. But that still doesn't solve the problem of a wait from anywhere from seven to 15, 18 years in some cases, with more people coming in every month and adding to that, that population. Yeah. At the end of the last session, we got a thousand waiver slots, 300, 400 in March. Another 700 will be, I think, the middle of next month. Um, yeah. How do you determine who gets it? And that's I mean, is, it, is it based on need or based on how long you're on the list? Yes, that's the confusion because yeah. it is both based on need and how long you've been on the list. And it's a it's a multiple sets of criteria that nobody can follow. So the solution to that is, and that's part of our, been our policy initiative last year and this year and going forward until it's done, is to take and, and absorb, in effect, open that up so everybody has a slot. And we're working at, our request is 25% of the current wait list every year until it's done. Um, that's, so in other words, it's a mix, a mix of who's on the list and what their needs are. And which county they live in and how critical their needs are. I mean, it, it's a whole lot of different things there. It is our contention that if everybody were to get a waiver slot, first off, the, the Department of Health and Human Services was asked this by the General Assembly, and the question was, are there enough people to do the work? And the answer was, no, we don't have enough. So instead of 12 or 15 or 2,000 slots, we got 1,000, which is marvelous. It's the best thing we've had in years, but it doesn't deal with the overall problem. Care management isn't going to change that. And, and so I, I would love to have the conversation. There are multiple groups out there and we are continuing to make that. But in effect, care management does not change the wait list, but it does put some pressure on folks to recognize there are going to be more people in need. So we need to step up and the state needs to open those doors up and add more slots quickly to accommodate the, the, the population that's growing. Okay, well, I have to leave. I have another meeting to head to. Um, I think that's kind of sad, but I don't know what yeah. to say. We agree. All right. Thank Have you. Have a good evening, everybody. Um, just to get to another meeting. Rolling through. Uh, do you have? Do we have a timeline of when the emergency waiver is available to apply for this year? I do not know that. I don't. I don't believe we've heard that yet. Okay. Um, and. I'm just going through these in order. What is the care manager? Is that my care coordinator with VIA? It could be because could be. all the care coordinators are currently in training to become care managers. My understanding, oh, sorry, John. It could also be 
your community navigator. It could be somebody that works with your community navigator at the organization or in wherever you're getting your services. It could be a number of different people or places, depending upon on what your needs are and what you want, really. If we currently use Sand Hills to manage our innovations with a community navigator in our plan, does that mean we lose our community navigator unless the ARC handles our innovations? We'll lose your community navigator unless you are doing agency of choice or employer of record model in which they will be limited to um, educating and mentoring you on how to best manage that model. Um, if you are, you're receiving innovations for Sandhills, so you will you will be eligible for care management. You'll be able to choose either your care, your current care coordinator for care management, or someone like the ARC or an advanced medical home. Okay, great. Um, am I understanding correctly that no one is required to sign up for a care manager to utilize waiver or state services? You do understand that correctly. One little caveat, if you're receiving waiver services, you're required to receive care coordination. It does not mean you have to use care management, the higher level function. Um, I think we covered this, but I'm going to ask it anyway. Will some care management be provided through LMEs in addition to the private organizations that will provide care management? Yes. In fact, the vast majority of care management initially we will be provided through the LMEs or tailored plans. And then, as John described earlier, that will phase out over time. It'll all, most of all, almost all of it will be moved out to the community. Fantastic. Okay. That actually is the last question that is currently in the chat. So, um, and, and we are right at the time. So what I'd like to say is, is thank you to the, those of you that are still hanging with us. If you have further questions, please send them to us. Um, I will, um, we'll make sure that, that we, we get those for, for the next webinar that we're going to do. Again, that's going to be August the 4th at 430. Again, this one is being recorded um, and will be translated into Spanish. Um, I see somebody saying, where is the first webinar? That is on the Arc of North Carolina's YouTube page. And I will, it's also, you can also find it by going to our website. But if you find us on YouTube, and I can send a, a direct link to everyone that attended today um, to make sure that you have it, um, we'll, we'll post this one there as well. Um, thanks, everybody, for attending. And with that, um, I will say have an enjoyable afternoon, and um, we'll see you very soon. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.